Right, I think we're live. Um, good morning, everyone. It is 8.06 on November 22nd, 2022. This is Deanna Diamore, Director of Health, um, and this is the Board of Health meeting. Present, we have Board of, Board of Health members Terry Quell, Janet Karpiak, Norman Weinberger, and our new board member, Joan McNeil. Um, and uh, Kim Aleem should be joining us shortly. So we'll get started. Um, the first item on the agenda, oh, sorry, also staff members, we have Megan Fogno, Deanna, Brian Weeks, and Aniela Fayon. Uh, first item on the agenda is approval of the October 25th, 2022 meeting minutes. Do I have a motion? So moved. Right, Dr. Weinberger, a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Terry, thank you. All right. Um, any comments, changes? Suggestions for the minutes? All right, hearing none. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? All right, uh, minutes pass. Thank you, everyone. So the second item of the agenda is the director's report. So my official part of the director's report is I wanna just uh, welcome Joan McNeil to the Board of Health. Really glad to have you join us um, and uh, excited to work with you moving forward. So just wanted to, to welcome her officially. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Um, next item on the agenda are staffing updates. So i um, happy to share that Catalina Mosquera, our uh, receptionist, is being promoted to public health program associate. Um, this is the role that Aniela had held previously, and now she's a project coordinator. Um, and so we will, uh, Catalina will be moving to that new position once we're able to, to backfill her receptionist role, which we all know is very critical at the health department. So we're going to start um, working on recruiting that, for that position soon. Um, and we're also actively recruiting for our part-time volunteer coordinator and another uh, full-time public health nurse. And so we had recently posted them and we're re reposting, reposted them. So those are um, active right now in the recruitment phase. Um, yesterday was National Public Health Workers Day. And uh, we were honored uh, by the Connecticut Department of Public Health. They invited all the local health departments and districts across the state, um, Commissioner Zatani, um, and other staff at the Connecticut Department of Public Health wanted to thank all the local public health um, workers for all their work during the pandemic. And um, she also presented us with a proclamation by the governor, uh, which we were all very honored to have. And so um, I shared it with the staff and, and with the board and we'll be you know figuring out where we can place that in the building um, proudly. Um, so really thankful for that. And, just wanted to take the moment to, to thank all of our staff, thank you as board members, and to thank all of our volunteers for all of their incredible work throughout the pandemic. Um, and the proclamation was, was really wonderful and really excited to have that recognition and um, also to have the commissioner um, thank us as well and for her leadership and her partnership. You know, we're um, you know, really working closely with the state health department on a, on a lot. And so really thankful to have that, you know, strong public health system across the state. So thank you to public health. Uh, thank you to everything. Thank you for everything that they've done, um, continue to do to, to support our communities. Um, also wanted to share Congratulations that. to the staff. It's really a pleasure to see an honor like that. They, that doesn't come around every day. So good job, everyone. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, we are also uh, we're still, we're still continuing with our flu clinics. I just want to remind everyone on Tuesday afternoons, information is on our website. If they haven't gotten their flu shot yet, um, we still have availability for flu for flu clinics. Um, also wanted to share that we are working on updating some agreements with universities to host students. So in the past, we've worked with UConn Nursing, and and now we're looking working at working with Fairfield University um, with their public health programs. And, you know, there's a lot of attention right now and focus and investment from the national level on public health workforce development. And so there's a lot of these great, a lot of great public health programs and programs in general for students um, in Connecticut and that we're talking with and thinking about how do we, you know, and it, of course, in partnership with the state health department on like, you know, creating that pipeline for public health workers looking at you know all the different positions that um, we're trying to fill now and in the future 
Um, in particular, we're trying to get more public health nurses out in the field and also um, looking at growing and expanding, you know, amongst their environmental health, public health workforce. So um, really excited to be continuing those partnerships with the universities and figuring out how we can uh, continue to attract um, students and public health workers into working in local health departments, because um, here's where all the great, you know, public health work happens at the local level. Uh, and those are my updates. Does anybody have any questions? Excellent. Right. I'm glad to see that you're continuing to work with students. That's awesome. And the students really love it. Thank you, Terry. And thank you for all your leadership with um, linking us to students. And it's been really, really great um, uh, working with you on that and, and, and your leadership and support for that. We've did some fun projects. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And we're going to continue them moving forward, too. So thank you. All right, next on the agenda is surveillance updates. So, um, Brian, I'm going to pass it on to you to give us some updates. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Thank you, Deanna. Hey, everybody. All right, so let's jump right into it. Let me share a screen. All right, so we'll start off with the COVID data hub. Scroll down to the CC COVID-19 community levels. So we're currently still in medium. We've been at medium for about the past nine weeks. Uh, again, just as a reminder what the, the COVID-19 community level from the CDC is, it's a three-tiered system, low, medium, high, looking more so at healthcare burden uh, relative to the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, as a reminder, what does medium level entail? Again, those at high risk for severe illness, you know, they should follow up their healthcare provider, figure out if they need to wear a mask and other prevention measures that they should be following. Uh, staying up to date with their vaccines, still very important for everybody, uh, as well as getting tested if one suspects they may have COVID or any COVID symptoms and obviously not going to work, school or other activities until they kind of get confirmation on what exactly is going on. Because again, we're in respiratory illness season, so it could be a lot of things. Uh, and so also for those at a greater risk of severe illness too, you know, if they should test positive, you know, seeking out the appropriate therapeutics as well to help treat it and nip it in the bud early. Uh, so there's no additional complications that may result. Um, so again, there's also the COVID-19 testing and vaccination, you know, link outs as well as the Norwalk COVID Info Center uh, with local guidance, you know, for everybody that may be interested. So always check those out. Uh, but jumping right into it now, um, this is kind of looking at for the big seven Connecticut cities. Again, the big gray areas, a lot of people are getting at home tested. So it's, you know, this is obviously test results that are reported, but, uh, you know, that's a big caveat at the moment with that uh, acknowledged uh, or in mind. And so the case rate for the last seven days and, and the, the PCR positivity has been jumping around a bit. Uh, as you can see, you know, a few days ago, it was at, you know, 64, 61. Now it's at uh, 51. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it could be a multitude of things, you know, especially now that we get closer to the holidays, it may also be testing sites may not be, uh, you know, scheduled as often or for as long as well as people are now traveling. So they're kind of rushing around, things of that nature. But it's good, obviously, if you are going to be going to any sort of gathering uh, to get tested beforehand, uh, just to see if you may be manifesting COVID, especially again, if you're suspecting any symptoms, uh, try to avoid that and adjust accordingly. Um, now, looking at, you know, a better metric for what's going on, especially in terms of severity of illness, we have the Connecticut COVID-19 hospitalized patient census by county. Um, and so what's interesting here, it actually has been decreasing. Uh, as you can see over time, uh, you know, we were only like a couple of months ago, and you know, 440 per se, but now we're at 324. Um, it was that Fairfield County was in the highest uh, for that patient, uh, COVID positive patient census, but now we're at second place. So Hartford County has jumped back up to 109, Fairfield County at 94, followed by then by uh, New Haven County at 81 for the most recent data from yesterday evening. So kind of better for Fairfield County to see us kind of not be in the lead there anymore, but uh, still again. We're higher than our usual. I mean, we're usually in the 80s uh, when it comes to that. So it's something just still to keep an eye on because that could very much change, especially you know, the big point I'm hitting home here is, uh, again, we have Thanksgiving coming up. And so that holiday is usually one of the big contributors to the change in trajectory relative to COVID and generally any other kind of respiratory illness, too. Um, so looking at it from a vaccination standpoint, because this is, again, one of our best prevention measures in terms of severity of illness. 
Uh, we're at 89.31% for all ages for initiated vaccination for the city of Norwalk, 80.69% fully vaccinated and additional doses received, 44.37%. Um, and as you can see, it's still kind of like the usual trend in terms of age groupings. Uh, the younger the age group, <clears throat> the little bit lower the, uh, the uptake has been. Um, but again, kind of keep in mind, um, you know, the eligibility as well as other items that kind of tie into that. But still, you know, there's there's opportunity to uh, get more vaccination out there. Keep in mind that we're still one of the best performing uh, cities in the state of Connecticut relative to uptake. So when this is looking at it from initiated vaccination, this is looking at it now for fully vaccinated and we're in the sky blue color uh, for the city of Norwalk. And we're pretty tied usually with, you know, Stanford as well as even Danbury. Um, and then also for additional doses. So again, the booster doses, you can see how we're pretty much in the top <laughs> top section almost. And so it's just something to keep in mind, you know, perspective wise, but nonetheless, there's still opportunity to get people vaccinated just to kind of really mitigate what, you know, what could be obviously a difficult COVID season as we keep getting further and further into the winter time in this colder, colder weather. Um, so then also the other helpful metric is the wastewater monitoring for Fairfield County. And as you can see here, it was dipping off a little bit, but now it's kind of picking up again. Um, and so right now with that surveillance, it's saying majority BA5 uh, from BioBot. But uh, nonetheless, it is showing things are picking up a little bit in terms of that wastewater surveillance. And we're going to get a little less data points because of the holiday week. Um, so we won't really kind of see the impact of that, say, till next week. But again, you have to keep in mind, uh, with COVID, it's a, it's a gradual increase uh, because of exponential growth. But once you start seeing it really pick up, it's, it picks up. So it's going to probably take a few weeks to see what the true impact is, but it's something very much to keep in mind. Now, looking at it from a natural perspective for the CDC COVID-19 community levels, Northeast is still experiencing you know, a decent proportion of medium. And as you can see for the state of Connecticut, it's kind of a mix of low and medium, which is actually a little bit changing the trajectory from before. Uh, what actually has been kind of holding steady and increasing has been more of the Southwest and, you know, parts of the upper Midwest, say, of the United States that has been, you know, entering more of the medium territory, especially as you can see here with Arizona, uh, as well as the four corners here. But then also, you know, you have, again, like uh, Montana and some other states, too, that are picking up and going to the high. So um, this is kind of interesting uh, in terms of that trajectory, because, again, that usually was in sync with the Northeast experience that as well. Uh, but, you know, things have kind of slowed down a little bit. So that may be what we're going to be getting to a little bit later with all the other kind of viruses circulating. Um, you know, but just to kind of clarify, you know, in terms of COVID picking up in at least especially other parts of the country, but also what can change the trajectory very much, very quickly for us is just all the different subvariants of Omicron that are circulating. So we got BQ1, we got BQ11, we got BA5, BF7, BN1, uh, BA46, BA526, and we got <laughs> quite quite a mix. It's it's quite a party, and it's all coming obviously at the perfect time for it to transmit during the uh, the colder weather, where you know social distancing and other things are not as easily uh, easy to do. Um, and so for BQ1, that's actually the highest now. So kicked out BA5, which we've been used to as kind of the uh, the most successful in terms of transmission. Uh, so we're at 25.5% for that, BQ11, 24.2%, BA5 at 24%, and then BF7 at, you know, 7.8, and then following that, BN1 at 5, and dot, dot, dot. Uh, but you can see a lot of these newer subvariants are kind of these this color band of, like, green. And you can see how quickly it grew, just like what we saw with BA5 over time. Uh, and you can see that from a regional perspective as well, just what the proportion is regionally speaking. So again, we're in Fairfield County, Connecticut. So yes, we still meet region one because we're in New England in the state of Connecticut, but we're also kind of very closely tied to New York. So we're also region two is a good representation of what's going on too. And that's New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. But you can see how green's almost, you know, it's more than half of, um, so those new sub newer subvariants are almost half of the uh, of that proportion relative to region two, say, pretty much close with region one, but you can see how all along the kind of perimeter of the United States, pretty consistent that, you know, it's almost half, if not more so, uh, many of these regions relative to these newer subvariants. So they are, again, very successful in spreading, uh, and they're all in, you know, prime destinations for travel, as well as even along the eastern seaboard. Uh, so that's just an important thing to, for us, all of us, to kind of keep in mind. Now, switching gears a little bit, because the other big virus that has been picking up pace is obviously influenza, which we're used to, you know, every season kind of seen uh, in terms of proportion. So this is looking at it for ED visits for influenza-like illness for the flu seasons um, and in proportion of it. And so as you can kind of see, for the most recent season that we're currently experiencing, 2022 to 23, here in the black, you know, it's obviously 
uh, a very unique uh, increase because it's much earlier than it's ever been with these other three years that we're comparing it to. Um, and so you can also see over time the total influenza cases uh, for this season so thus far. It's been increasing. And then you have to keep in mind some of the data for the most recent week usually takes a little while to filter in. But it's been very high. And that's also a national trend as well. Uh, if you look at it by county for the current week, for the number of influenza county uh, cases, you see Fairfield County still the highest. And then if you look at it for the current season, it's much higher than uh, everybody else, almost double. Uh, you know, next followed by New London, which actually has been picking up a little bit because it wasn't the case before. Um, but it's just interesting to see how, you know, especially these metrics have continually change over the week. And then, you know, looking at the contributors, you know, the typing of the uh, flu viruses that are circulating. Unfortunately, we do have a mix, um, you know, so we have the type A. We also have type B circulating, but obviously not to the extent of type A. Uh, the big thing is keeping an eye on H3N2, which is one, again, nicknamed the hospitalizer, which is circulating. And, you know, it is being uh, detected in specimens, especially when you look at it, say, for 40 or 50 plus years of age, which is, again, usually the big uh, age group that gets impacted by uh, influenza, but also there's pediatric patients being impacted as well. So less than 10 years of age is actually still, you know, the fourth highest relative to the age groupings relative to hospitalized patients uh, confirmed with influenza. So um, we got a lot kind of happening here, and it's just an important thing to kind of keep in mind. And again, looking at it from a national perspective, just looking at this map, which used to be a nice green during the uh, the summertime, uh, is now you know a lot of shades of dark purple uh, as well as red or even orange, and so you can see again the southeast and south um, of the country is really heavily impacted by influenza, uh, and then when you look at the eastern seaboard, including you know, like you know New Jersey, our neighbor, as well as you know New York, um, you know part of the tri-state area, and so you can see how they're in the high, if not very high, categories along with us being in the high. Um, so it's just something very much to keep in mind that influenza is you know, experiencing that uptick and is also kind of rapidly increasing too. So it's just another important thing that we're kind of combating. And then RSV, which we've been hearing about, which we talked about, uh, but just having a little bit more visuals tied to it. This is looking at it from a national perspective. Uh, so just not to make it too confusing, if you look on the right-hand side in terms of detections, um, and if you look at these lines here for antigen, which is the blue, and then the purple for PCR detections, you can see how uh, the RSV detections are some of the highest it's been in the past two years uh, for RSV, nationally speaking. Now, zooming in a little bit and looking at it for the state of Connecticut, um, unfortunately, it's insufficient data for the antigen testing, but for the PCR testing, you can see how the number of detections is, again, uh, a historical high, and it's only been increasing. That's a pretty steep curve to see it increasing. So RSV is also one of the big items that are, you know, kind of uh, causing a lot of illness and potentially also hospitalization, especially with the pediatric population. Again, as I mentioned in the past, it's kind of making up for lost time, uh, given the fact that, you know, uh, because our prevention measures are so good, a lot of individuals that would routinely get exposed and kind of work it out, uh, gain immunity that way, did not. And so now it's coming all at one time, so to speak. And so that's what's kind of happening. And that's also kind of like a news article that was covering this. It's a little bit older, but it's still kind of relevant because children's hospitals are overwhelmed right now as a result of all these circulating viruses, and especially the RSV flu, and then COVID also being a part of that. But then again, there's also a lot of other viruses circulating that are contributed to that are not as well surveilled. So you got like rhinovirus, which you know, along with the milder coronaviruses, which all kind of cause the uh, the common cold to some extent. You got metanumavirus, you got parainfluenza. There's a lot of other viruses too. So we have to kind of keep that in mind. And more or less, this is tis the season for them, uh, along with the great the holidays too. Um, and so again, you know, CDC still had this great little kind of snippet here, just kind of reminding everybody to stay safe for the season. Again, if you're attending events or anything like that, uh, to be mindful to screen yourself accordingly. Um, you know, screen others as well, you know, kind of arrange the events to minimize the risk of transmission as best one can, you know, increase ventilation, you know, wear masks if possible, you know, especially again, if people are traveling a lot of different things, so they have the risk of exposure potentially, um, and, and just adjust accordingly. Uh, we just got to be mindful of this because, you know, again, like I said, uh, Thanksgiving is usually the big catalyst that we see the continual uptick of COVID activity. 
Uh, but again, we got a lot of these other circulating viruses, too, that we want to be mindful of mitigating transmission as well. So there's a lot of good reasons to do so. Uh, switching gears a little bit, monkeypox, just so we kind of stay in the loop about it. So far, it's been pretty stable for the state of Connecticut. This is, again, just the CDC map for the whole country. Uh, I'll just jump over to, you know, the metrics for the state of Connecticut. So it's at 143. It's been like this for the last uh, week or so. Um, and you can see if you look at uh, here, I'm just going to move the zoom bar here. Uh, you can see looking at it from the week by week basis, it's been holding steady and it's very obvious that it's a downtrend here. So it's very good to see. Uh, again, you know, not as much risk at the moment, per se, in terms of this uh, where we were again back in August. But keep in mind, a lot of these holidays are social events, travel, you know, getting together with friends and all that kind of stuff. So. Unfortunately, that may also change trajectory. So we want to just kind of keep uh, keep in mind that, you know, this can stay this way and stay low as long as we're again, we're being very cautious and, and mindful of that there's still some risk relative to this. Uh, but again, you know, the holiday is one of the big things that can change a lot of that. So again, you know, everybody be smart about it, you know, use common sense, practice the prevention measures that we've just been talking about, uh, as well as just, you know, think about not only yourselves, but also others. And so that's naturally, I think, a good theme for the holidays as well. But uh, that, that's my update for everybody. Thank you, and have a great holiday. Thank you so much, Brian, for that presentation. Um, do any of the board members have any questions? All right, thank you, Brian. Um, we're gonna pass it on to Megan Vogno who's gonna give uh, updates about immunizations. Good morning, everyone. Oh, just give me a second. I think you guys should be able to see the PowerPoint now. Yep. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm just giving um, some immunization updates related to COVID. Um, as you guys may remember, Teresa, a couple months ago, gave some updates about the CAP program. Um, which is a similar program to the IAP program that Pam Bates runs. Um, but the focus of this part is really COVID-19 vaccine, um, making sure it's accessible in the community and folks are educated. Um, and so I'm just going to share some of the outreach activities we've done in the last few months. Um, so the progress I'm going to be talking about is from July to September of this year. Um, as you guys know, we have three community health workers that are out in the community every day. Um, and so in that this period, they attended over 75 events um, and they engaged with over, with over 3,000 people. Um, and then down below is just some vaccination rates for Norwalk. So as a reminder, this program actually oversees Norwalk and the surrounding towns, as well as um, Danbury and some of the surrounding towns. Today, I'm really just focusing on um, some of the work done in Norwalk. Um, but you can see initiated. Um, vaccination coverage for all ages is at 89.43%, and then fully vaxxed is at 80.51%. Um, so small increases over time, as you can see. And that's also including the younger age that, you know, opened up, so the, that pediatric age. And so some of the outreach opportunities to the right, you can see uh, an example of one of our table displays. This was actually at the South Norwalk train station. But we go all over the place. So we're at farmers markets at the Norwalk Community Health Center, Rowayton Market, and the Rainbow Plaza. So a lot of those are starting to slow down with the weather, obviously. So we'll be, um, you know, switching gears and doing other activities. We do a lot of business canvassing in targeted areas. So we partner a lot with Brian, um, and he's able to supply us with vaccination coverage for the IAP um, and CAP areas. And so we're able to really target certain communities and neighborhoods with lower vaccination coverage to um, canvas, you know, either at laundromats or bodegas or barber shops or all types of places where we're going in speaking with business owners, speaking with patrons, um, hanging up signs, um, giving vaccination information of where they can go to get vaccinated. Um, and also offering the state uh, Griffin ran clinics to those locations. So if we go into a business and they're interested in maybe hosting a site, our community health workers are able to connect them with the Griffin vans um, who then can come down and vaccinate. Um, we've worked a lot with early childhood centers in Norwalk and the surrounding towns. And so a few in Norwalk have actually taken us up on those Griffin vans and you'll see some pictures later on. Um, so a lot of times at the early childhood centers, we do 
um, information sessions, kind of like a table display during pickup so parents can kind of ask questions. Um, and then a couple weeks later, the Griffin vans come, our community health workers go out again um, during those clinics and yeah. assist the, um, you know, with a table, answering any information and promoting the vaccine. And so that model has worked really great um, in Norwalk at the, you know, daycare centers. We attend all types of community events, wherever there is an event that they'll allow us to go to. We usually ask to have a table there. As you can see in the picture, the South Norwalk train station. So on either side, uh, the New York side or the New Haven side, we're on. And that's a weekly um, thing that we usually try to go to. The Norwalk libraries. Um, so we've been to East Ave, South Norwalk, and the main library doing you know tabling events there, person to person. Um, Stepping Stones Museum in the month of August, we were there once a week um, as they were promoting, you know, right before summertime, they, you know, were having a lot of activities. So we were there capturing a lot of parents coming in. Um, we work closely with the community health center. So if they have any kind of activities going on or just even letting us do a tabling event outside their clinics, we, um, you know, take advantage there. We've even gone to the Maritime Parking Garage, which is like, you know, not your usual suspect, but there's a lot of people that park downtown in those garages. So we set up a little table or we just, you know, have our community health workers walking around as people are parking to, um, you know, share information. The Norwalk Oyster Festival we attended, Open Door Shelter is a weekly one that we usually try to go to, National Night Out at the Norwalk Police Department. We've attended our own booster clinics and flu clinics. Um, and then we do, you know, we really have a great partnership with Family and Children's Agency, and so we work closely. They also have community health workers, so a lot of times we tag team and we'll go to events together or we'll share events that are going on. Um, and then this um, this period, we also um, reached out to a lot of our pediatric offices as that younger age group was eligible to be vaccinated. We wanted to ensure that they were either offering the vaccine. Um, sharing, you know, where they could go if they weren't offering the vaccine, you know, where they could send their folks, ensuring that they were really giving a strong recommendation um, for the vaccine to those parents, and making sure they had all types of educational um, materials inside their um, offices. So if they didn't, some of our CAP team members went out to drop off materials. Um, and then also just, you know, supporting them, right? So if they had questions on setting up a clinic or ordering vaccines, we were able to assist with that. Um, so now I just have some nice pictures to show you guys. So this is um, Ellie, Rochelle, and then Sarah. Um, she, Sarah is an outreach worker for the IAP program. So we've partnered a lot, you know, just with the traditional IAP and a lot of the um, the outreach efforts. So Sarah will be share will be sharing, you know, um, general vaccination information while we'll be sharing COVID related information. So this was at the Head Start um, orientation barbecue, and then they also had an outreach day. So this was really well attended from families um, in that program, and so they loved having us there. All of the farmers markets, um, so Rowayton, Rainbow Plaza. We attended and folks loved us there. <laughs> the NAR Community Health Center Pediatric Department. So this is, again, is something we try to do, um, you know, quite often. The NAR Community Health Center will let us um, go out right outside their pediatric office. And so we bring coloring books and things to engage the children with while they're waiting, but also being able to educate the parents about the vaccine. And then they're right there at the NAR Community Health Center, who's a provider of the vaccine, who can then vaccinate their child. So this was Jake, one of our community health workers there. This is at Rooms to Grow Preschool, um, our Griffin Clinic. So like I mentioned, to the right, all the way to the right is the information table that we'll have when parents come um, to pick up. And then during their, um, both of their clinics, so the first dose and their second dose clinics, we attend it um, with the Griffin uh, folks. And so that was a really nice event. They vaccinated, I say a ton of people, because at this point, like, 27 people is a ton of people at a clinic for a COVID booster, including kids and families. And so that was a great um, event to see. YBI Community Day. We also have a spin wheel that we take so that folks who come up to our table and can be a little bit more interactive. We find that children know more about COVID and COVID vaccination than parents, right? So a lot of times the kids are answering the questions better. So that's Jake and he, they spin the wheel um, and we have little prizes to give out to anybody that answers correctly. 
that's it. Any questions on immunization? Thank you, Megan. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I see someone from the public had said that um, the the monkeypox screen is still up. I just checked on my phone and YouTube, and I was able to see Megan's slides. I don't know um, if anybody else can check uh, their Zoom, but I think it, I just checked on YouTube, and it, it it was it was linked into where we were in the meeting. So I don't know if somebody mine else was saying start. yeah. My slide said that they were showing. Yeah, so I don't know if it's technical issues on the other end. Um, okay, thank you, Megan. Um, we have the next item on the agenda is a 2023 meeting schedule. Um, and so we're, we're due to submit the, the, the schedule for our Board of Health meetings um, from January to December 2023. Um, we have to submit that next month. So I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention and to start thinking about when we want to meet uh, for you know next year. I know in the past we've pulled board members and we can certainly do that again for availability. Um, this year we we uh, tried to have more evening meetings. Um, we had to cancel one of them and then we had another one where um, we didn't have any uh, public participation at that one. But I think talking with staff, like the alternating between morning and evening, I think can be confusing or if we don't have a set schedule. So we're trying to wonder, do we want to set, you know, um, you know, existing standing meetings like for all 12 months at one time, like a set schedule and then, do we want to, if we, if the board decides that they want to have them in the mornings, do we have like um, special meetings in the evening periodically through the year? And we have like set agendas with certain topics that we really are looking to do presentations and get feedback on. Um, just wanted to throw that out there for everybody. But um, uh, just any general thoughts about the meeting schedule for next year? Well, my general, my general thought is I, I do, uh, it's much easier for me to do meetings. Um, my day starts here at seven o'clock, so I can take off a, an hour for this meeting and the evenings are really Thank you, Dr. Weinberger. And we also have any comments? Um, I can send out an email to get, we can send out a poll to see availability if that works for everybody. All right, hearing no comments, that's that's what we'll do to follow up. All right, thank you everybody. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is strategic planning updates. So we have some slides and I'm going to try to share my screen, hold on. <laughs> Can you all see my my uh, slides? Yes. Are they in presentation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. No. Okay. Now are they? <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so we're continuing to make progress on the strategic plan. Um, we wanted to provide provide you with an update. So we're really hoping to adopt this new vision. Um, as you recall, the vision is compelling and inspiring image of a desired and possible future. Um, in the past, our vision has been excellence with efficiency, but really speaking, um, uh, looking at you know, what a vision is and where we wanna be going, um, we wanted to create a more um, inspirational image that was um, more you know, reflective of you know, the, the future and where we wanna to continue to grow. And so we've adapted um, this vision, uh, healthy Norwalkers thriving in our vibrant community. So we wanted to share that again with the board um, as we move forward with finalizing the strategic plan. Uh, we would like to keep our mission statement because we think it's a pretty accurate um, statement. Prevent and control the spread of disease, promote a healthy environment, and protect the quality of life within our changing community. Um, but we also have, we've done a lot of work on the value statements, and you'll see in some of, some of the colors um, where we've made changes and additions. So 
Um, we wanted to add health equity into, um, into our value statement. So we modified our first value statement and now it says we value health equity and our role in promoting optimal health for everyone in our diverse community. So that's a modification of our first value statement. Uh, we also wanted to put um, accreditation in, in there in the value statement. So our second value statement, we modified it to say we value quality and consistency by incorporating public health standards and best practices into our operations and maintaining our status as a nationally accredited health department. Uh, we wanted to add transparency in, so we added to our third value statement, we value ethical behavior, accountability, integrity, and transparency. Uh, community trust became a big theme um, within our discussions and um, thinking about, you know, public health fields and, and, and um, where we are um, since the pandemic. And so we wanted to add as the fourth, in the fourth value statement, community trust. So we value high levels of customer satisfaction and community trust. Um, when we talked about our workforce development value statement, we, we wanted to add not only just the growth of our own staff, but our volunteers, um, knowing how important they are, and then also thinking ahead about where we are with our future public health workforce. So our fourth value statement we're proposing, we value the development and growth of our staff, volunteers, and the future public health workforce. And we, or we would like to leave our sixth value statement um, as is, we value collaboration and partnerships to improve community health by sharing information resources and ideas. Um, so before I go any further, does anybody have any thoughts or comments on any of these value statements? Some of the proposed changes? Do you think they look good? <laughs> I think they look great. Thanks, Janet. I think they look great also, and I'm so glad we changed our vision statement because it's so much better than the old one. <laughs> thank you, Terry. So yeah, if any, yeah, thank you for bringing up the vision statement too. So any other comments related to the vision as well? All right, great. Um, and so I'm going to pass it on to Megan now to talk about this word cloud because she saw this uh, example in another department and she brought it to our team and we've been working on this. And you might have seen it. She put it in her PowerPoint slide. Um, her <laughs> she's, she, she snuck it in there. I snuck so. it in. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Um, so, I, you know, as we were like looking, you know, to get inspiration for other um, vision or mission statements, you know, we, we in public health, we love to look at other health departments. And so I was looking at another health department and I saw this word cloud and all the words around it. And I really just thought it would fit great for Norwalk. So um, right in the center, we have healthy Norwalkers, which is like, that's our community, right? Um, and then all around it are things that we want to be to, as a health department to the to the community. And so I saw that they utilize this a lot on PowerPoints, on letterheads, on, you know, any publications that they were sending out, just having that front and center. So on our on my PowerPoint this morning, I decided to add that there. Um, and so you see some of the words, you know, like empowered, um, an empowered community and transparency and collaboration and um, you know, prevention and communication, respect, like all those things, um, those are all words that came up while we were doing a lot of the strategic planning sessions that we wanted to include somehow, but then um, too many goal statements or mission statements were going to get too wordy. So I was like, let's take some of those other words and put them here in a word cloud um, around healthy Norwalkers, which is something that we're, you know, striving to always um, have here in Norwalk. So I don't know if there was anything else, Daniela or De Deanna, but I saw it and Daniela put it together. It was, you know, an idea I had seen and she really put this word cloud together. So thank you to um, you, you both. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, Daniela. Does anybody have any comments about the word cloud? All right, I think it looks great. 
All right, so here's where we are with our goal statements. You, you remember we talked about the different priorities that came out during our sessions and they're in the bold here, workforce development, public awareness and trust, evaluation of programs and services, foundational infrastructure improvements and technology. And so this is what um, the staff have put together in terms of how to you know, flush that out into a goal statement. So for workforce development, continue to build and support a diverse, happy and skilled workforce. For uh, public awareness and trust, it's strengthen community awareness and trust of the health department. Um, our third goal is provide impactful programs and services that support community needs. Uh, the fourth is strengthen systems, processes, plans, and policies to assure a high performing health department. Um, and the last goal statement we're proposing is effectively use and enhance technology to optimize the delivery of public health services at the health department. Um, so all of these goal statements have draft work plans that are, you know, they're in the work right now, we're working on them. They have all these uh, different areas have facilitators, staff have been leading sessions um, with other staff across the department and putting this together. We have, you know, several objectives, activities, measures, deliverables, timeframes, so we're all flushing that out. And so it wasn't quite ready to bring to you all today, but we wanted to just show you where we are in the process. But we're getting really close and we're hoping to wrap it up um, next month and be able to share, you know, all the details of like how we how we meet all of these goals. But wanted to bring it back to you all to see if you have any thoughts about the goal statements. And we can certainly follow up and send them an email too um, afterwards if you want to have more time to think about all of this. All right. Not hearing any discussion, so I will um, send. We'll send these afterwards, and then please let us know if you have anything, um, any thoughts about it. And thank you. Any other questions or thoughts related to strategic planning? Just really want to thank you know board members for helping participate in in these sessions. You know Ken and Terry um, participated very actively, and um, just want to thank them and thank the whole staff for coming together and putting putting the plan together. Anything else related to strategic planning? All right. So our last item on the agenda is public participation. And I see we have a hand raised. Daniela, can you bring our, um, I think it's uh, Diane Larcella. Would you like to, to speak? Uh, good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can, good morning. Thank you, Ms. Diamore. Um, good morning. Um, welcome aboard uh, your newest member of the Board of Health. Such an important role for all of you. Um, my name is Diane Loricella, and um, I would just say that um, I, I really enjoyed listening to uh, the presentations by staff, and I am very happy that Megan and others, I know it's a team effort, have uh, showed you as the Board of Health many places where there are display tables. I myself did see uh, a display table when I went to the senior center for my, uh, my flu shot, and I uh, appreciated that. Um, and there was also um, uh, many of the information is in Spanish, maybe Haitian as well, I am not sure, and that is a great goal. Uh, however, uh, I, my, my long time ongoing concerns are still, uh, are still standing. And I ask Ms. McNeil to review some of my statements at public when I have spoken at the public portion of the session. I still think we need to rethink some of the public outreach related to COVID and the other, the flu, uh, especially and RSV. Um, while I very much appreciate Mr. Weeks' uh, monthly uh, review of data and colorful charts, very important for many of you. The data is important, I'm not denying it. However, out on the street, I have been around Norwalk for over 35 years. I have gone to public events. I have gone to ShopRite, 
stop and shop, even and the libraries as well. What this department, and I believe also the state of Connecticut is doing, and I will try through my way of, of trying to help them step up their game, and that is the heavy emphasis on vaccination with very little focus on the alternative measures one could take, not to eliminate the flu or COVID, but to reduce the chance. Remember that old saying, flatten the curve. Well, the public grow, grew weary. I'm sure your staff, uh, the staff grows weary. Um, I'm just asking that we make sure we're covering the base of while Mr. Weeks quickly mentioned this morning, uh, ventilation, masking, the public in general is not hearing that. And at the display table in the senior center, there were opportunities to educate people about if they choose to wear a mask, what kind of mask, how not to wear the mask in a graphic design that I have discussed before. Those are missing still. So Ms. Diamore, I will make an appointment with you because uh, we, can, we can do this. We can get these things, they're all, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but I do feel that you get the cooperation of group companies like Stop and Shop and ShopRite to display a poster, colorful poster. I'm sure others have it. You don't have to invent it, but you may want to. We have the money through ARPA funds for education materials that'll, uh, and the uh, previous funds to stop the spread because it is not just vaccination. People we know now that are vaccinated could get COVID. It's milder and that's terrific. Um, I think the CDC has uh, messed up again on, the, on, the, on their messaging, but I live in Norwalk and I love Norwalk and I love all of you. I just, uh, I'm uh, for the sake of Ms. McNeil, I'm an environmental consultant and scientist, and I have been asking my good board members for a while since COVID began to see how we can put our heads together and to use creative means. While I was very impressed by what Megan put together, the general, I've, I've been to several major um, events where I'm usually one of the few people wearing a mask. Now that is a, my own choice. But the thing is, I think if these people knew the potential risk, maybe that wouldn't be the case. And I do think we should also provide free uh, KN95 and maybe even uh, at least KN95 masks with the money we receive from the federal government in, and, and announced in creative ways through the press, they'd be happy to help you announce it. And I've also, I get the Norwalk Hour. I look at Nancy on Norwalk. I get out and about. Lastly, I was a paid checker at the uh, election time, November 8th. I again was one of the few people of the checkers wearing a mask. I received no indication to protect myself. Simple words that I everyone could, could have um, taken to heart. Uh, people were grabbing others' license plates. I mean, I'm sorry, license, driver's licenses and other forms of ID in order to check whether they could vote. Um, I will be speaking with Stuart Wells and Ron Banks, but I would have liked the health department. Now I would like to know, did the health department weigh in as far as our election and polling spots? These are all public gathering spots. Again, I'm not saying, I love the fact that we're doing a lot of interesting stuff with vaccination. I myself am boosted with the BA545. It's just that there are other preventive measures. As we know, this BA5 and now BQ1 and BQ1.1, they are more contagious than the original uh, 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 COVID-19. So why are we not talking about many of the measures that helps lower or lower the, the spread or flatten the curve, shall we speak? Those are important too. And the public depends on you all to be you know, the experts in the room. And I know you have, the, you just mentioned through Brian's discussion, all the things going on, but the public isn't going to look at all these charts. 
even though they are available on the, the hub, I did look at the hub last night to double check before I spoke. So while this is all good on a website, we need to use creativity. I don't see it, I get around. So um, I don't even wanna, I hope no one will counter me on this. I mean, I'm, I'm just not seeing it even at the libraries, just a poster so that you, I know you're short on staff, a poster, a picture says a million words. Let's, let's use the same enthusiasm I've heard during this meeting to now just, there's one, one gap that still exists and that is graphics to help people use other means to flatten the curve. They still stand, they're not too old, it's just that people, the issue of ventilation, for instance, I think would be a great idea for an evening meeting. And I do think it's a good idea because the public hasn't known about or participated in the few evening meetings you all have tried to do this year. Um, let's, let's, I'll be happy to go, go wide and send emails once you decide on it, but maybe the issue of ventilation may be a good idea for a winter special gathering of the public. I'm sure you'd get a good crowd if they're given enough notice and it's creatively put together. I thank you very much. I also do a lot of environmental justice work. And I think this has, I'm so happy that equity is now within your goals. I think there's a lot of work to do because I've done some projects in Norwalk where environmental equity and health were a big problem. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Laura Trella. Thanks for your comments and um, for taking the time to be here today to share them. Um, reflecting on what you're saying, um, you know, we do we do have flyers and we do hand out some masks at events and we do talk about that messaging. But I think some of it also is, um, you know, how do we create an environment where those who want to wear masks feel comfortable doing so and supported in doing so? So um, giving us a lot to think about. So thank you. Um, Okay, it is 8.57. Any other items from the board before we wrap up and adjourn today? All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, hope everyone has a happy Thanksgiving um, and we'll see you in December. 8.57, we will adjourn. Thanks, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much.